Hi, what is a smart reopening? What are economists and epidemiologists telling public policy um, officials? Um, this is a lecture about the paper, the one paper we read with James Stock and his colleagues who are epidemiologists. I wanna quote from Diva Shridhar, who is a public health expert. Um, she asks, not um, when this will all be over, but the right question is how do we continue with the virus before we have a vaccine? And that is the policy question for this class. Um, how do we have a smart reopening as opposed to a dumb reopening? What the paper poses is a trade-off. They construct a GDP to risk index and it looks something conceptually like this. A smart reopening trades off risk with the growth in GDP. Risk is defined by this paper as the increase in the r naught by adding a marginal worker to a sector. That's why the model had to divide the entire economy into sectors based on how close workers had to work next to each other, um, based on the value of that sector to the economy, mainly measured by the amount of pay um, in that sector. They used um, ONET data, which is a description of every single job. The other aspect of the, of the job is whether or not people can do it from home. So working from home, um, how valuable the sector is, what the workers pay is, and whether or not when they are at work, whether or not they have to, um, they have to um, work very close together. You can imagine a set of policies, and they have several in the paper, um, policies that range from protecting the older workers by um, not allowing them to go to work, um, people over 65, um, versus very strict um, contact contract tracing um, and quarantining using cell phone data, a whole set of policies. Some set of policies they found are dumb, that they um, provide a lot of risk measured here in the rate of infection um, for very little increase in GDP. A whole other set of policies are smart, that just for a little bit of risk, you can get a lot of GDP. So does that make sense? A whole set of policies that are dumb, high risk for little reward, whole sets of policies that are smart um, because there is a, only a in, slight increase in risk um, and a huge increase in um, GDP. And they note, that they can take advantage of a lot of different kinds of combinations all over the world and in the past in order to array um, the United States along these set of policies. What I wanted um, to tell you is that without having a therapeutic like Tamiflu for the for the virus, now Tamiflu is um, a um, um, a medicine that reduces the symptoms of the flu, but it only um, works if you take it when you're pre-symptomatic. So the hope that there will be a therapeutic that helps mitigate um, the the causes the the risk of an infection, it will may only will be possible for people who are pre-symptomatic. And pre-symptomatic people um, don't know they have it, so they probably won't take it. Um, what we found in this model is they divided the population into those who are susceptible, exposed, infected, quarantined, and dead. So they added to um, the SEER model by adding the quarantine people and the people who are dead. They did some sectorial accounting um, to account for what sectors were high value. You may spend some time on page 41 looking at their um, index of high valued um, industries. You'll see that white collar occupations are coded as high value. Um, people don't have to work very closely to work in those, for instance, and they're very high paid. And depressingly, um, education services, entertainment, are quite low value because they require close, at least the way we've done it before, 
close content and not all that much um, GDP. Now that's educational services in general. And we've already noted as also this paper notes only briefly that if um, K through 12 um, sector doesn't take into account the child care um, aspects that that other ancillary benefit from K through 12, then we might be underestimating the value of that um, occupation. The open, I mean that that sector opening the K through 12 sector could be very expensive. Um, they found in their simulations that um, keeping older workers away from the workplace actually did not have very much effect. Withdrawing them from the workplace um, did not reduce risk that much because people over 65 have a lot of contact with personal care workers, food service workers. They have non-work related contact. And so it didn't matter that much. They also found that dumb policies um, were policies that did not limit non-work contact um, um, interactions. So we could think of these policies as picking the uh, and protecting workers in the high-end sectors, eliminating the um, low-end end sectors. That's in our CPEM model, um, do collective behavior, um, protect workers in high-end sectors, eliminate the low-income sectors, and then mitigate um, the effect of, of the second wave with therapeutics and other such, uh, you know, and other such policies. But it turns out that just protecting workers in high-end uh, um, sectors without reducing their non-work contact wasn't that helpful. Their conclusion is that a strong economic reopening, little risk for a lot of reward, um, does entail picking out the sectors um, that are high valued and protecting the workers there, but it also requires that non-work social um, contacts are eliminated um, quite a bit. And we've been struggling with how do public policy makers put in effective CPO orders um, or smart ways of getting out of your house, don't have to do the shelter in place, but as you venture out of the house, be safe, when that behavior depends upon a whole set of factors uh, pertaining to the consumption of COVID-19 um, news, pertaining to the what kind of news that people watch, and probably a whole other sectors of factors that we don't know very much about. See you on Monday.